My name is Jim Donahue. This presentation is titled Fuck Gentrification, the Conflict Between Alternative Anti-Sectarian Space and Post-Conflict Development in Belfast. Uh, obviously, it's a, a critique of development um, as a form of gentrification, hence the air quotes. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'll be talking about in the next 20 minutes, I'll start by looking at the uh, context of Belfast city centre from the militarisation of the landscape in the 1970s and the 1980s during the period of the Troubles conflict uh, to its neoliberalisation from the 1990s onwards into the 2000s and how that neoliberalisation of space accelerated in the 2010s. I'll give a sense of the importance of space to punk scenes and also the importance of those punk spaces to, uh, to, to the city more widely. I'll also look at the reaction of Belfast punks to gentrification, and then I'll conclude by asking what is being lost in the neoliberal development of Belfast city centre. By way of an overarching framework, I would draw on the Lefebvrean idea of space as always being social. So as Routledge puts it, uh, we can view cities as spaces of contestation in a time of rapid urbanization and ongoing neoliberal capitalist development. And that contestation is of course political. As Lee and Yo frame it, places are actively forged as products of the politics of inclusion and exclusion and by power struggles and punk space is caught up in this nexus of conflict. Uh, Belfast city centre was enclosed by the British army in 1972 in response to the provisional IRA's bombing campaign of that year. Uh, there was an evening time curfew in the area and there were search points operational during the day. You can see one of the main um, search checkpoints on Royal Avenue in the picture on the left. Um, the Ring of Steel existed in some form or other until 1990, but it was at its peak um, between 1976 and 1982 and gradually reduced in, in size uh, thereafter. You can see the, the largest extent of the Ring of Steel uh, in the late 70s and early 80s in the map on the right hand side. Um, and this, this period of 1976 uh, coincides with the emergence of the punk scene in Belfast. Uh, in the map that you can see there, the area to the immediate northeast of the image, the, the top right, just outside the ring, uh, that was an area known as the, the Half Bap, which has been redubbed the Cathedral Quarter. And as a result of the militari militarization uh, of the area, commercial and cultural life seeped away from the city centre, leaving dereliction in its wake. As a direct result of this, a significant proportion of the punk spaces that I will mention have been located in this area, just outside the Ring of Steel. And this also applies to arts and cultural organisations and to LGBT spaces. The affordable rents and the undesirability of the place uh, actually served to open a space for marginal cultures to, to occupy that. Um, so this uh, cultural regeneration was, was genuinely grassroots in the 1980s. Um, but it was supported by the state through the Urban Renewal Grants Scheme in the 1980s, which helped people buy property uh, or rent property in this area, special uh, cultural organisations. Um, in 1989, the Laganside Corporation was founded by the state with the principal purpose of developing uh, this area and, and the uh, waterfront along the River Lagan, uh, to, just to the east of the city centre. Um, so these were large scale building projects um, paid for by the, by the taxpayer. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, state sponsored form of gentrification, quite different from the uh, traditional interpretation of gentrification. Um, but it's quite similar to other cities like uh, Beirut and other post-conflict cities where the state steps in to gentrify areas that have been damaged by conflict. Um, this corporation continued through the 1990s and eventually wound up in 2007. So later examples of uh, development, uh, generally post-conflict development, the, the troubles uh, ended with a peace agreement in 1998. The, uh, the Obel was started in the late 2000s. It is Ireland's tallest building, although there's one in Dublin that's currently being built, which will surpass it. 
Um, and as I said, it started before the 2008 financial crash. Um, the financial crash caused the building to be delayed, so it was only finished in 2011. And because of the uh, lack of people to take up residence in the building, it went into administration with, with huge debts in 2012. So it's the tallest building in Ireland, and it's a huge white elephant. Um, I think a lot of it is still vacant to this day. Um, there was other developments uh, to the north of the city centre, uh, adjacent to the former Ring of Steel area in North Street. Um, the Sunflower Bar kind of countercultural space was saved from demolition uh, after a campaign in 2015 and 2016. Uh, the Orpheus building, however, um, was not saved. It's on York Street. Uh, it was a famous dance hall venue. And um, it's, uh, it was an example of uh, Art Deco and neoclassical architecture in the city centre, uh, but it was demolished in 2015 as part of the expansion of uh, Ulster University's Belfast campus there. And the Tribeca uh, development will be the next um, uh, uh, development that's going to happen in the Cathedral Quarter. This will be a mix of apartments and offices. Planning has been approved for that throughout 2019 and in 2020, uh, despite widespread opposition to this project. I'll discuss that a wee bit more later on. So that's kind of a, a part of history of uh, development in the city centre of Belfast. But the key points to bear in mind going forward in this are that the city centre contrasts starkly with the persistence of Troubles Belfast in areas still characterised by peace walls and interfaces, as O'Dowd and Comerover put it. So other parts of the city have not been developed uh, to the same extent, and sectarian geography and sectarian segregation is the lived reality in most areas of Belfast still. And uh, This development agenda in the city centre is, um, is closely tied to a, a peace-building narrative. Um, that is, as uh, Comerover and O'Dowd put it, this ideological construction that peace it's about normalization through neoliberalization of the Northern Ireland economy with Belfast at its core. And the basic idea of that is that if the economy is strong, then people won't be interested in fighting sectarian and nationalist wars, and that will bring peace and normality. But uh, Belfast is far from normal, as I will highlight. So punk space, um, space is essential for punk culture, as it is for any culture. Uh, as Simon Springer puts it, uh, all groups, whether subaltern or dominant, cannot constitute themselves unless they produce a material space. Uh, Debbie's Carl highlights that of all punk spaces, those where punk music is performed are the most important locations for the subculture, uh, but hangouts, residential houses, record shops and other spaces are also key, as I'll highlight. And as van der Steen and all emphasise, in both squatted houses and rented social centres, the focus on youth and alternative lifestyles remains a constant, and this is a key site of link with, linkage between radical politics and subculture. So punk politics are enacted through their occupation of material space and the performance of punk and anarchist identity in those spaces. There have been... Uh, loads of punk spaces in Belfast city centre. Um, some have been commercial bars or shops, others have been explicitly uh, anarchist social centres which were rented uh, and there have also been anarchist squats um, squatted by punks. Uh, the first uh, physical space uh, that was punk was really the Good Vibrations record shop, home to the Good Vibrations record label, started on Great Victoria Street right in the city centre in 1977. Um, it uh, reopened in various places. It also reopened uh, in the late 2000s, finally closing in 2011. It's also uh, venues in the Cathedral Quarter, such as the Harp Bar and the Pound. Uh, you can see in this picture of the Harp on the right-hand side, those barrels are filled with concrete at the front so that nobody can drive a bomb into the front of the building. So uh, the, the conflict architecture is, is in and around these places. Um, I'll rattle through the rest because there's so many and there's not much time. Uh, it was also the A Centre of Long Lane. Uh, this was an initiative by the anarchist at Just Books who wanted to uh, stress the anarchist underpinning pinning of punk culture. It was the Warzone practice space on Donegal Street, which was 
housed by the Belfast Unemployed Resource Centre, a trade union initiative. In 1982, this grew into the Gyro's Punk Social Centre on Donegal Lane and another venue from 1986 to 2003. Uh, there's also a series of punk squats in the Holy Lands area to the south of the city centre. St Anne's Square, or Writer's Square as it's known, uh, was a, a popular punk hangout and a skate spot. And punks also started living in the block of flats beside St Anne's, uh, which was a, a block of social housing. There's also been a string of commercial bars in the 2000s, especially that were um, key laveries on Bradbury Place, the pavilion on the Ormo Road, and perhaps especially the front page on Donegal Place. Got an image of the front page here. This is a little bit towards the end of the punk period of the front page when they actually painted the outside and put flowers on it. Usually it was a much dingier place when we were there. Um, these spaces were particularly important when the war zone centre wasn't in existence between 2003 and 2010. Um, but these were uh, commercial bars, as I say, so the promoters were often difficult to work with and the bouncers in these venues often targeted the punks uh, with prejudice and violence. There have been other spaces uh, more recently opening in 2011, Dragon Records in the city centre, just home to the Punkorama record label. Uh, the Little Victoria Street War Zone Centre opened in 2011 and closed in 2018. I'll discuss that in more detail uh, in a moment. Um, there's a bar called Voodoo on Fountain Street in the city centre. Again, it's a commercial bar, but it's a rock bar, much more friendly uh, to the punks that visit there. The bouncers don't beat the shit out of them, basically. And there's the Bridges Skate Park, uh, which opened in 2011. There's been a vibrant skate culture in Belfast since the 1990s, at least, um, centered around St Anne's, as I mentioned. And the lateness of this skate park opening is kind of um, instructive as to the council's disregard for alternative culture. Uh, big, vibrant scene where kids skating all around the place. And it took until 2011, you know, some 30 years of skate culture in Belfast for the council to actually take it seriously and provide a space for that. So the first question to ask is why is space so crucial to punk culture? Uh, to give a sense of this importance, I can read a few quotes from the Warzone Dialectogram project. This was a piece of collaborative ethnography um, uh, in the Little Victoria Street uh, Warzone Centre in 2018, just before it was demolished. So people said things like, the place had a real home, uh, homeliness. It's a dirty, smelly, weird building that everyone feels really comfortable and themselves in. Uh, we didn't have to deal with these people in bars, promoters and all, didn't have to deal with meathead bouncers, we didn't have to worry about a bad crowd coming in. It's a good place to feel safe. I think everyone, everywhere should have a resource like that. There's definitely a need for it, the same now as there was maybe 20 years ago. So the Warzone Centre was a safe space, a space for free cultural expression and an alternative community resource. And what's the importance of punk space then to the wider context of Belfast? So again, these quotes are from the Warzone Dialectogram project. I'll actually be discussing that in more detail tomorrow at 1.45 in panel number 1118, if you want to learn more about that. And some quotes again. Uh, the collectivism and looking out for each other, it's something that you don't get in other places. You'll never find anywhere else like that in Belfast. It's a counterculture factory. And the gentrification stuff, people in the collective almost feel a responsibility to try and maintain some sort of indigenous street culture, working class culture, punk culture, DIY culture. So this alternative space is actually an alternative to normative culture and normative space elsewhere in Belfast. It's not just a, a, a airy term of alternative as a tag. This space is different to other spaces in Belfast. And it's a source of alternative cultural production and it's a self, it has a self-conscious opposition to the gentrifying dynamics of space in the city centre. However, uh, numerous um, interviewees in the Dialectogram project specifically downplay the importance of uh, material space. Loads of quotes like, the Warzone Collective isn't a building, it's people. Um, I think six or seven people said nearly that exact same line. Um, and maybe this was a kind of uh, denial in the face of the impending eviction, um, but actually looking at reflections of the closure of the previous Warzone Centre in 2003, uh, quote in the bottom here, a Warzone member said, um, people didn't realise what they had until it was gone. That's from the Gyros documentary by Jardine and Chandler. 
And I think that people who downplay the significance of space in 2018 would probably now uh, align more closely with that post-2003 reflection because punk and anarchist culture really have suffered the lack of a dedicated social centre in the years since. It's actually interesting to compare the reasons for the closure of those two war zone centres in 2003 and in 2018. Um, and I think that's instructive to the changing pressures on punk space in the city centre. So in 2003, there were two distinct narratives. One was about funder indifference and how the group would have to restructure to please funders. And a separate reason given by people is uh, burnout and the lack of a new generation willing to take up the baton to run that space. And uh, different cohorts within the Warzone Collective um, use those quite separately, they don't overlap. In 2018, uh, the burnout of core volunteers was a key theme again, but this was intertwined with gentrifying pressures, distinct to 2003. So the rent in, in, the, in the most recent centre was exorbitant. It was a huge pressure. And when the final eviction came uh, in 2018, the appetite for resistance was limited, uh, despite a large number of seen participants. Um, so gentrification is, is the key difference here, and it's been recognised by punks in a few cases from the 2010s onwards. Uh, this quote from the dialectogram kind of encapsulates, encapsulates that. They said, local buildings and local landmarks are being regenerated. They're being flattened and replaced, and the social history is being replaced as well, and replaced with a shiny new identity. So uh, this is recognition of gentrification also comes through in punk songs, or one at least, uh, imagery and graffiti, and in the Warzone dialectogram project itself. So I'm going to play a, a, a song here. Apart from the, the song about gentrification, there's also been imagery. Uh, the image on the left here is a T-shirt that was made for the final Warzone Fest in 2018. It reads, fuck gentrification. On the right-hand side, uh, graffiti on the front of the centre before it was demolished, saying, fuck landlords. The Warzone Dialectogram project tried to uh, situate the uh, importance of this punk space in the gentrifying context of Belfast. Again, uh, that'll be on tomorrow at 1.45, panel 118. Um, it's also a question uh, why this punk space wasn't squatted when it was being evicted. Um, as Finchip Maddock highlights, punk is automatically connected to squatting. There's a lineage of punk squats from the Holy Lands in the 1980s and 1990s. There was an occupation on Royal Avenue, although it wasn't a punk one, in about 2011 and loads of Warzone Collective members have been actively involved in squatter communities elsewhere. So it's interesting to ask, why didn't this squat, sympathetic crowd squat the space that they were being evicted from? And, and the reasons for that are burnout and the financial burden. So some quotes again from the dialectogram, uh, it became quite a stressful thing. Somebody said, uh, I'm glad it's closing, honestly. And people said things like, it's literally the most unmotivating concept to just be doing fundraising uh, just to pay rent, just to keep a building open. Uh, and I think uh, someone said, I think we barely kind of trudged along. So because of the gentrifying, grinding gentrifying pressures of high city centre rent, people were to a degree glad to be rid of the burden of the centre and its mounting debts. And people were too exhausted simply to mount an energetic squatting campaign. In Belfast too, there is the risk of paramilitary involvement if the landlord decides they want to get rid of squatters by extra legal means. So the conflict lingers over that situation too, but expensive rent is the overriding factor that volunteers point to. Gentrification is the key in this case. So uh, just to wrap up then, I realize I'm slightly over time, what is being lost? Who, you know, who cares if there's no punk space in Belfast city centre? Um, as Barrett puts it, Punk's elaborate network of counter institutions, including music venues, are sites of resistance to the privatizing agenda of neoliberalism. So less punk space means less space for resistance to gentrification. Why? Because as Routledge notes, uh, struggles for spatial justice and the rights to the city must politically mobilize, mobilize from their material spatial conditions. So a counterculture without space is ineffectual in the struggle for space. Um, as noted earlier, the Warzone Centre and other punk spaces are genuine alternative spaces uh, as opposed to merely non-sectarian spaces. And as Murta stresses, 
The presence of difference is not sufficient to make integrated and interdependent communities. And if cities such as Belfast have simply displaced one form of segregation for another, then the success of post-conflict transition will be a hollow one. So that new form of segregation is along lines of wealth and class because of gentrification. And the conflation then of neoliberalism and peace building is a weak one. Simon Springer, anarchist geographer, um, gives a warning here. When a society lacks a dynamic public space that allows for agonistic confrontation among diverse political identities, a more nefarious uh, space may open where alienation fosters alternative identifications along antagonistic divides like nationalism, religion and ethnicity. I think that message of warning uh, could not be more important than in the case of Belfast. Um, so I'm slightly over time, but uh, this is a picture of what Writers Square looks like now, big public space and the Tribeca development will reduce it to the little space you see on the right hand side. So that alternative space where the May Day March starts, where the punks hang out, um, will, will disappear. It's, it's actually a, a private land grab of public space in Belfast.